Some persons stand out for their dedication to a place, a movement, a community. Early in their life, they are drawn to give themselves away, their whole life, to a lifelong project that they perceive is greater than they are. When we speak of the Archdiocese of Gruard McLennan, there is one person above all others that stands out. He was, yes, the first bishop of this diocese. But long before that, he was a dedicated and hard-working missionary who gave his life for the people of northwestern Alberta and their growth in faith. Emile Jean-Baptiste Marie Gruard was born in Brulon in Brittany, France, on February 2, 1840, son of André Gruard, a gendarme, and Anne Ménard. After his early education, he emigrated to, in 1960 to Canada, like his cousin, Vital Justin Grandin, an oblate missionary who later became the first bishop of the Diocese of St. Albert. For the two years following his arrival in Quebec, the Gruard continued his studies at the Grand Seminaire de Quebec. Having stated his wish to join the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate, he was ordained to the priesthood in Boucherville, Quebec, by Bishop Alexandre Antonin Taché, the Bishop of St. Boniface. That was on May 3, 1862. The oblates then sent him west to St. Boniface, where he would begin his novitiate. Before we go further in this saga, let us try to place ourselves in the Canadian Northwest in the early 1860s. There was as yet no Canadian nation. There were few roads. Travel was by foot or horse or water. No railway yet linked the still unconnected villages and communities that dotted the landscape. Various tribes of indigenous peoples lived on the land, maintaining their livelihood by hunting, fishing, and trapping. European settlers were becoming more numerous as they moved onto the land and built homesteads. The only authority in what was known as Rupert Land was the Hudson Bay Company, which carried on a trade in furs and commodities with indigenous and non-indigenous alike. The Hudson Bay Company established itself in trading posts they called forts. At the same time, Christian churches built up missions with the purpose of bringing the Christian gospel to indigenous peoples, as well as ministering to the educational, spiritual, and medical needs of indigenous and settler populations alike. On Pentecost Day in June 1862, newly ordained Father Gruard, then 22 years old, but not yet a professed oblate, received his religious habit from Bishop Taché and headed north by boat with Father Petito and a Métis guide to Lake Athabasca. Here he continued his novitiate under the direction of Father Clute. This is how Father Gruard described their provisions on this boat trip north. We each had our travel case, and Bishop Taché had supplied for our voyage. Thick wool blankets wrapped in oilskin, a tent, a stove, a tea kettle, plates and iron pans, knives and forks, a bag of dried meat, a large sack of pemmican, a barrel of biscuits, some ham, tea and sugar. We were to live on this for two months. The bishop led us to the river's edge, gave us his blessing, embraced us tenderly like a father would, and we took our place on the boat." End of quote. Having begun his novitiate in St. Boniface, he completed it at Fort Chippewan, Alberta, and professed his final vows at the mission in Fort Providence, Northwest Territories, on November 21st, 1863. His cousin, Bishop Grandin, received his vows. Father Gruart quickly took on the way of life and activity that was required of a missionary in the day. Recognizing that his youthful age and appearance would be a deficit, he grew a beard in order to appear older. He wore this beard for the rest of his life. He perceived and worked around the intricacies of relations between the indigenous and settler populations as these different peoples began to share the same physical spaces on land and waterways. Recognizing the absolute need to speak the languages of the people, he quickly and proficiently learned the local indigenous languages beginning with Cree, Chippewan, and Beaver. He evidently had great skill in this regard, 
During Holy Week services in 1863, Father Isidore Clute told Bishop Taché that Gruart preached his first sermon in Montagne without an interpreter. He would later print the Bible in the Montagne language. At the same time, he also had a creative flair and skill in music and hymns. He wrote many songs and religious hymns in the indigenous languages that he mastered. Another useful skill and talent of this young missionary was the art of painting. While in France for medical treatment in 1870, he took lessons in drawing and painting from the Christian brothers in Paris. Over the ensuing years, he plied this skill in many churches and chapels in his mission stations. He decorated a side chapel in the church at St. Albert and an altarpiece for Notre Dame des Victoires in Lac La Biche, in Fort Chippewan and Fort Dunvegan, in Fort Simpson and Lesser Slade Lake Post, now called the Hamlet of Gruard. As soon as he had been sent to Lac La Biche, Gruard had become aware of the difficulties of provisioning the growing number of northern missions along the waterways. To ensure that the missions would receive adequate supplies at reasonable cost, and to reduce dependence on the Hudson Bay forts for their provisions, Gruard assembled the necessary materials to construct a sawmill at Lake Athabasca in 1892. Over time, this sawmill built three boats. A steamboat, the Saint Joseph, would navigate the Athabasca River between Fort McMurray and Fort Smith. Two years later, the Saint Alphonse was built to service between Fort Smith and the Arctic Ocean. Finally, in 1903, the Saint Charles, a stern wheeler, was built for the Peace River, the major waterway in his vicariate. This boat served Gruard himself as the bishop of his vast vicariate and transported him along the Peace, Mackenzie, Slave, and Athabasca rivers. The savings that accrued from this enterprise were used to better maintain his missions, establish new ones, and erect convents and other necessary buildings. Gruard often spoke in deep gratitude of the Oblate brothers, whose skills and labor both built these boats and operated them. In 1874, Gruard returned to Europe for a much needed two year sabbatical. It was during this stay in France that he became interested in the art of printing. Before returning to Canada, he acquired a Stanhope printing press, which he had shipped to Lac La Biche. Here he set up the first printing press in Alberta. He had syllabic type specially designed for him in Brussels. With this, he put the press to good use, publishing several books in the Cree, Chippewan, Beaver, Montagne, and Lucheux languages. In 1877, he and Bishop Farrell printed the first book published in syllabic type in Alberta. Years later, in 1906, he resumed the printer's trade by publishing A Life of Jesus in Cree syllabics, and later he put out a Montagne dictionary. On October 18, 1980, pardon me, 1890, Father Emile Gruard was appointed titular bishop of Ibora and in succession to Faro, vicar apostolic of Athabasca Mackenzie, based at La Nativité. He was consecrated in St. Boniface by Archbishop Taché on August 1, 1891, he continued to reside at Fort Chippewan from 1891 to 1901. As a missionary, Gruard was concerned with the disruption brought about by the arrival of white settlers. The presence of survey parties and land speculation in Dunvegan in 1883 and in Fort Vermilion the following year troubled him, and he feared the Peace River District would be settled in the near future by an influx, influx of newcomers. As was happening elsewhere in Western Canada, the growing number of settlers from Eastern Canada, Europe, and the United States made the negotiating and signing of treaties both inevitable and necessary. Because of the close ties that existed between the indigenous peoples and Catholic missionaries, the government negotiators were keen to enlist the assistance of Oblate Fathers as interpreters and hopefully to assure the chiefs of the benefits of treaty. While the highly respected Father Lacombe played a key role in convincing the chiefs gathered at Lesser Slave Lake in June 1899 to sign Treaty 8, 
The Federal Indian Commissioner, David Laird, had also invited Gruard to participate in its negotiation. Lacombe later claimed that if Bishop Gruard had not advised the chiefs to sign the treaty, telling them there was nothing which was not to their advantage, the treaty would still be waiting to be signed today. To be truthful, Bishop Gruard was not in all things optimistic about the outcome of Treaty 8 and suspected that the true motive of the government was colonization. This is how Gruard described the beginning ceremonies for the signing of Treaty 8, and I quote, A huge tent had been set up in a large open area. The commission took on an almost military-like atmosphere as a trumpet sounded and an honor guard presented arms to, to the government commissioners. The Indians then arrived. Commissioner Laird stood, stated his title and commission, and then produced his letters patent bearing the royal seal. He then outlined the intentions of the government, the area of the territory it wanted to annex, and the obligations it promised to fulfill, freedom for the Indians to hunt and fish, with guarantees of land, agricultural machines, seed, livestock, and so on if they wished to take up farming. The government also promised $5 per head each year, chiefs were to receive $25, and headmen $15 a year. All would receive twice the amount in the first year. Finally, the government promised to establish schools. End of quote. According to Gruard, Laird told the Indians that they were not obliged to accept the treaty. They were to deliberate the government's propositions, choose a chief and counselors to speak for all, and come back for a second meeting. Bishop Gruard could see that many of the indigenous leaders were hesitant, as Gruard himself was. The signing of treaty would mean a huge change to the people's way of living. But would not signing the treaty enable them to retain their way of life? No. With treaty, there were promises from the government of Canada that would obviously be beneficial as they entered a whole new era of engagement with settlers and developments in their homeland that were beyond their control. Father Lacombe had greater confidence than Gruard in the government's sincerity to maintain treaty promises. In the end, the chiefs agreed and signed. Gruard, though more sensitive to the indigenous concerns, also encouraged some to sign. A short anecdote displays some of the feelings at play. At the Little Red River, Gruard had to solve a case of conscience when a Cree chief who had been baptized only recently refused to sign the treaty on the grounds that he would be stealing. The government proposes that we hand over our country and in return it offers us money, the chief explained to Gruard. But I didn't make this country. It is God who made heaven and earth. Therefore, if I receive money, I would be stealing. I would be selling something that doesn't belong to me. Taken aback by the chief's logic, Gruard described for him that the money was a compensation. According to Gruard, the chief understood, and without hesitation he accepted the terms and signed the treaty. Among Bishop Gruard's concerns about treaty was schools and education for indigenous children, which was one of the federal government's commitments under Treaty 8's terms. Given the final developments in Manitoba in 1870 and the Northwest Territories in education, where French linguistic rights and Catholic school privileges had been abrogated, Gruard was already worried about the schools that would eventually be opened in Treaty 8 territory. After it was signed, and in the spirit of honoring treaty and its promise of educating Indigenous children, Gruard recommended that the government establish Catholic boarding schools for Indigenous children in the Athabasca district. As a result, Ottawa funded five schools in Gruard's vicariate during his years as bishop. These schools also functioned as orphanages for children who had lost their parents. In our present day, we have seen fierce criticism of such schools in the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's study and report. In my reading of Bishop Gruard's ministry among the Indigenous peoples and his concerns for their welfare, I have found nothing to suggest that he understood these schools to be for anything but the education and betterment of the children and their communities as a whole. <laughs>
One storyline woven through Bishop Gruard's history that modern minds might find hard to understand is the animosity between the Catholic and Anglican missionaries who were preaching and baptizing in the same time and place. The suspicion and denunciation of one another was fierce and was equally expressed by each side against the other. What divided these two camps was not only religion, but also language and culture. This was evident in what they wrote about one another and in what they said on occasion to the other's face. Given my own very positive relationships with successive Anglican bishops, Archbishop John Clark, Bishop Fraser Lawton, and presently with Bishop David Greenwood, I am happy to declare that this is no longer the case. When the Vicariate of Athabasca Mackenzie was split in two in 1901, Bishop Gruard retained the territory of Athabasca, while the Vicariate of Mackenzie was entrusted to Bishop Brenna in Fort Smith. Gruard moved to Lesser Slavic Post in 1902. A gifted missionary and administrator, Hamil Gruard found time in 1923 to publish his memoirs entitled in French, Souvenir de mes 60 ans d'apostolat dans l'Athabasca Mackenzie. In recognition of his long-standing and dedicated ministry in this region, the Athabasca Vicariate was renamed for him in 1927, and he is honored to this day in the name of our Archdiocese. Gruard resigned as Bishop of the Vicariate in October 1929. As a further honor in recognition of his selfless ministry, he was named the titular Archbishop of Aegina on February 28, 1930, a little over a year later, on March 7, 1931, he died in the Gruard Hospital. He was 91 years old. I began this tale of adventure by stating that Bishop Emile Gruard was the most outstanding figure in the early history of our archdiocese. It is worth our getting to know him better, getting to know his character and his engagement with the indigenous peoples that he came back to work closely with and to admire. Many have suggested that his memoirs be translated and published. I have taken up that pursuit, and in the few years that I have left as your bishop, I hope to make some headway in this pursuit. <laughs>